What's happening, Mark Allenbaugh? I thought I'd start off with a little musical interlude, but you probably can't hear this, can you? Yeah, I can hear it, yeah. Oh, a lot of times when I'm on Zoom, it blocks out the background noise. It, it goes, it's going in and out. Uh, I, can still I got it. the guideline blues, okay. making me sad. I got the guideline blues. Driving me mad. I'm oh, making this shit. up as I go along. Yeah. And the bigger problem is I'm never gonna find anything that rhymes with acquitted conduct. <laughs> Maybe uh, orange does. <laughs> orange? Yeah. Orange rhymes with acquitted conduct? Yeah, it's a joke. Uh, Nothing I rhymes with orange. I don't get it. <laughs> oh yeah. shit. Well, I you know, we're just get it's just one of those days, and i just was so excited because I have you back on the podcast it's been a minute and yeah, so I, I push record and um it's it's uh only 1 18 p.m on a thursday afternoon which means no tequila for me today mm. i mean i'm a man of standards you know i'm not just drinking all day right so i figured if i couldn't talk tequila i might as well spice it up with a little song over a million americans face sentencing every year and it will be the most important day of their lives but we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is, and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Hey everybody, Doug Passan coming to you from Studio 3553 in Scottsdale, Arizona. Listen, the, the this relatively newly reconstituted um, guidelines commission, after putting out some some significant hits on their first record, like zero point offender and expanded compassionate release, criminal history points, all that stuff that we've been talking about on on several other podcasts. Well, guess what? They're they're about to release their uh, follow up album, their 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 sophomore effort, if you will. So the question is, will it be worth the wait? Will it have any more hits? Can we dance to it? Um, and so what? that's what we want to talk about today with my good friend and colleague and sentencing guidelines guru, Mark Allenbaugh. What is cooking? What's in the works uh, in terms of new guideline amendments? We're going to run those down and talk about some of the nitty gritty of, uh, of what may be coming down the pike for November 1, 2024. Welcome back, Mark Allenbaugh. Hello, Doug. Welcome. Or welcome. To, why am I saying welcome to you? Well, uh, I feel very <laughs> welcome. Thank good. you. Good, good. Uh, so, yeah, the commission is um, has a number of amendments uh, that they have proposed. And they recently had two days of hearings on most of them, not all of them. And, uh, the, you know, there are a few here that that are kind of uh, big ticket uh, items, uh, one of which acquitted conduct, and we'll get to that. We, you know, we've spoken at length uh, about that. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think the ones that are, are most important for the practitioners out there and defendants and judges to be aware of are the five that I'm going to address. And that's uh, intended loss, uh, youthful offenders, acquitted conduct, as I mentioned, a technical amendment, which frankly isn't technical at all, and it has to do with 4C 1.1, and this uh, effort to simplify the guidelines, which to me is a little bit like rearranging chairs on the Titanic, deck chairs on the Titanic, as they say. Well, so simpler first, guidelines yeah, would be a nice thing. Yeah, but they're, they're, that's the thing. It's a simplification process, and it's not really simplifying the guidelines. It, it has to do with whether departures are going to still be called departures or not it's the the, the three-step process but we'll mm. we'll get we'll we'll get to that it, it's a distinction without a material difference that the, the commission is engaged in here even though they put a lot of effort into into this so i will the, say this though by the way on departures because i think this yeah. may be relevant is my pet peeve that word isn't my pet peeve that we that lawyers still use the word downward departure when after Booker, which was 2005, we're almost 20 years later, the yeah. guidelines became advisory. We talk about variances and the whole goal. I mean, words matter. There are still recognized downward departures in the guidelines. But the point is, under this new regime where they're discretionary, I just feel like when you give credence to this 
the old school language because it used to be you could never depart unless in these very limited circumstances where there was a departure ground right and i right. i just feel well, like let's, let's let, then let's just let's kick it off with, with addressing yeah. the simplification process all right so so to to your point uh shortly after booker it's been almost 20 years as you noted uh the a a three-step process that courts were to employ when they were applying the guidelines developed and that three-step process was first you look at the guidelines calculate the guideline range and that's basically everything through chapter four which takes you all the way through criminal history then you look at chapter five and specifically two two uh provisions uh subpart h and subpart k and there they have departure provisions. And as you noted before Booker, departures were identified grounds that uh, courts could depart from the guideline sentence below, below the guideline range or above the guideline range, mm -hmm. but in very it, really rare circumstances. The, yeah. Departures were relatively rare, like I think less than 10% of the time right. uh, were, were there any departures. Uh, because the guidelines at, at that time before Booker were, were mandatory. But then once Booker said the guidelines were advisory, now the question was what happens with departures because they're only they're merely advisory. Well, what the courts said and the Supreme Court too is, well, you should still you, you have to still consider departures because they're still part of the guidelines. But then after departures, after you consider the departure, the grounds for departure, now you're supposed to consider the 3553A factors, basically anything else for purposes of a variance. So you had the guidelines, right. then you had departures, and then you had variances, and that was the three-step process. But as you well recognize, since the guidelines have been advisory for almost the last 20 years, what really is the, the difference between departures and variances? And except in really limited circumstances that have to do actually with the federal rules, rules of criminal procedure, they really don't have any difference. And the, the problem has become, too, is that they're rarely used, that yeah. judges across the nation now rarely rely on specific grounds for departures. Rather, they just use a variance. Right. And uh, the problem then is, well, what grounds for a variance are they articulating? Well, basically, it could be anything or a combination of anything. So yeah. it has been hard to track, really, what the reasons were for a below guideline sentence. Was it a class departure? Was it a variance? If so, what yeah. was the combination and how much weight and, <clears throat> and all of that? So anyway, well, what, what the commission has decided to do or is proposing to do is not get rid of departures per se, but to reclassify them as additional grounds for consideration that, that a court could make or, or that a court should consider or may want to consider in certain circumstances. And, you know, that's as, you know, if the commission is really trying to get rid of variances, that may be, I mean, that I guess that's one way to do it, but it doesn't really simplify anything because that second step, nobody in practice follows anyway. And this is what I meant about by the rearranging chairs, uh, deck chairs on the Titanic, because it, do, it doesn't make it, there, there's a lot of problems with the guidelines. They are very difficult to follow. They're very ambiguous. There's internal inconsistencies. Uh, they've developed in a, many different ways. Sometimes there's been a lot of uh, congressional input or co congressional directives that the commission didn't want, but they have to put in. You know, other times there's just been policy reasons or there's been mandatory minimums, which effectively is a congressional directive. Uh, so there's been a lot of stops and starts to how the guidelines or particular guidelines have evolved and they become a mess. And then some have become so complicated that there are guidelines unto themselves, specifically like 2B1.1, the fraud guideline with its 20 different SOCs or you know the drug guideline with the, the, the drug table and all the calculations that go involved. So by getting rid of this second step or, or ostensibly getting rid of the second step by removing the term departure and just calling it additional grounds for consideration, it's a distinction without a difference. It really simplifies nothing. And it's not going to make any real world difference in the grand scheme of things of how sentencing progresses. Yeah, that seems much ado about nothing. It's and much ado about nothing. And yeah. I remain convinced if the judge can consider any reason under 3553, basically, then these departures are almost completely irrelevant. And I say almost because the only time I ever invoke them 
is when I am making a 3553 argument to say, by the way, this is such a powerful reason for a variance that it's long since been recognized as a departure ground under the guideline. To say yeah. basically, like we've known this is not this is not this is nothing new. We've known that this is important since the dawn of the guidelines. And I don't want to use your word departure because you know, but but it's it's certainly clear grounds for a substantial variance. You know, and this goes in my aversion to using their language of departures goes back to this thing that they that I was I was I'm a geek because I, I'm sure mm -hmm. you were too but I was listening in on the commission's hearing public hearing that they had a little mm -hmm. while ago to hear them talk and and this this subject of the anchoring effect came up mm -hmm. more than once and I'm not sure I heard that term but it was a term that just burned a hole in my stomach because it's a very real thing which is even though it's not supposed to work like this, the guideline calculation still carries far too much weight with the judge, with the powers that be. When these guidelines are supposed to be just one consideration out of right. many factors, but the anchoring effect, what is an anchor? It implies that it's so heavy and so rooted and so unmovable that yeah. the whatever these guidelines are going to be should be unshakable. And that is not how this is supposed to work at all anymore. Um, right. So I feel like the more we can get away from this idea that those guidelines have such power and such yeah. authority, the, the better we are. And that's one small way to do it is by abandoning the language. Yeah, um, or, or, or either the other way is to create guidelines that actually are meaningful and kind wow. of uh, and, and follow actual sentencing practice because as we know some guidelines are rarely followed sure. or, or I should I, 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 or, or, or there's departures more often than not the child por pornography guidelines you mean and variances so, more often variances yeah variances <laughs> you know sentence below the, the guideline but it but at any rate you're right you know one thing though I do want to show just on the screen while before we leave this particular topic um okay. let's see if I can share while you do I'll a do a musical song. interlude while you yeah, interlude while musical you share. interlude um but just to give everybody so what I'm what I'm showing here is the uh table 43 from the uh the source book of uh federal sentencing statistics that the commission publishes every year and here are the reasons that courts have given for uh downward departures and this might be a little hard to see here but um it may, uh, uh, up here, uh, <laughs> the the uh, what those guidelines been doing to me? Oh, right. I'm I'm saucy today. <laughs> yeah, and this is me without tequila. But go ahead. Yeah, wait, wait. Actually, let me see if I can make it. There we go. That's how I make this bigger. Okay, so we can see here. These are all the different grounds for departures, and what you you immediately see is that yeah. over no. a quarter of them are two things: substantial assistance. Yeah. Um. And early disposition programs, and that's generally yes. for your uh, illegal reentry cases. Yeah. yeah. Immigration cases. Okay. So but, let's stop there for a second. But because that's there's a long tail. I'm sorry. Th sorry. I just th this is an interesting point, especially for people who don't know the federal system so well. But I'm not surprised to see 5K went at the top of the list. Yeah. That is a downward departure for giving for being a cooperator. And and that is basically the currency of the federal system. The first to right. run to the prosecutors and tell on everybody else is going to get this downward departure that is the most popular one, mm -hmm. uh, 5K1.1. And then for the early disposition, as you mentioned, these are in immigration cases, reentry cases, because they have what's called a fast track program, which means... You, you were going to give you the best plea possible up front, and you're going to take it very quickly and make this case go away. And if you do, you're going to get an early disposition 5K 3.1. So what does that tell all these people who think they know so much about uh, the immigration policy and how we're letting illegals run rampant through the country? It tells you that we're prosecuting these cases in such massive numbers that the system doesn't even have the capacity yeah. to to deal with it. And so we're offering, you know, better pleas for quick resolution to move these things through the system faster because we're prosecuting a shit ton 
of uh, people who come here illegally, especially those, the priority is for those who come here illegally uh, who've been in trouble here in the past. They're, they get prosecuted and they receive serious prison time. Um, and they'll get some reduction for getting the case over fast. But I just wanted to put a, make a note of that. It doesn't have necessarily anything to do with what we're talking about today, but it's certainly relevant to the public. Well, just a, 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 on that note, Doug, immigration cases, there are a plurality of federal cases overall. In other words, they make up the largest group of federal offenses in any given year, and they've been that way for the last several years. Mm -hmm. they, they outnumber even drug cases, which used to be the number one. Right. So, you know, here's the Sorry, thing. Sorry, Katie Britt. Yeah, right. So here's the thing with the uh, downward departures. As we see, when we start going down this list, and uh, some of these are listed by the, the the guideline provision, you can see all of them, what, we, what st statisticians will call there's a long tail, meaning there is a whole bunch of little ones. You know, these are all... You know they're they're rarely they're rarely invoked. There's there's such a wide variety of downward to departure to, uh, provisions, but yet they're rarely invoked. the The point is there are so many grounds for to for sentencing right. outside of the guideline range that it's statistically meaningless. What the commission really should do if they wanted to make this simpler and stuff, it, you know, have a better defined ground, and they have it's obviously going to have to be generally uh, defined. But something that would capture, you know, general mitigating circumstances and stuff like that, and why that's listed as a variance, I don't know. But yeah. that's what the commission's doing. So it's a it's it, it's a mess, even with how they're collecting the data on this. Well, that must drive a statistician such yes. as yourself, Batty, yes. that it's really makes it impossible to keep good stats, and that um, really seems to undercut the whole one of the whole goals of the guidelines in the first place was to be data driven. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that, exactly. that so, yeah, I, it so. just leads me to believe that this whole guidelines thing is time to admit is a failed experiment and we should move on. But I know we've had that debate before and we've had it. Yeah, we, we, but too. we're gonna we we should do That's a whole for another podcast time. on that. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so, real offense. Well, so and... you know, to me, it's like get get. Get to something good, Commission. That's a that's a waste of time for the Commission, in my opinion. That is not a song I would be jamming out to on the next record. What's okay. next? So the next one, this actually is the complete opposite. The Commission is going to make the guidelines so freaking complicated by what they're doing with intended loss. It is, it, excuse me, it is stupid. So... There was, you and I have discussed this, I think, in one of our other podcasts from a long time ago, but mm -hmm. there was a Supreme Court case back in 2019 called Kaiser versus Wilkie. Mm -hmm. It was a civil case, had nothing to do with the guidelines, but it had to do with administrative law. Yeah. And the issue in Kaiser was under what circumstances should a federal district court judge defer to an agency's interpretation of its own regulations? And for years, there's been this thing called the Chevron standard, where basically yeah. uh, district courts were to always defer, unless you know, unless the the agency's interpretations of its regulations were just absurd. Um, courts should defer to to, yeah. to the agency how the agency interprets its own regulation. The well, lawyer, the lingo, the lawyers called it Chevron deference, I believe. Yes, exactly, yeah. Chevron deference. So Kaiser comes along and had reined that in a bit. And what Kaiser said is uh, uh, courts should only defer to agency commentary if the actual regulation, there was something in the regulation that was genuinely ambiguous. So it really had to be genuinely ambiguous before you looked at the regulation. So uh, many courts across the country have applied Kaiser to the sentencing guidelines, to various provisions of the guidelines to find that, for example, in intended loss, that intended loss, intended loss no longer is can be utilized. Um, now, th there have been some sort, there have been some circuit courts. There's actually a split on this. Some circuits, like the Sixth Circuit, have found that um, the term loss is genuinely ambiguous. So, therefore, you can go ahead and defer to the commentary. And why does that mean? Why is that relevant here? Because the commentary defines loss as either the greater of actual loss or intended loss. 
Those are two completely different animals, though. Actual loss measures the actual harm that the offense created and intended loss, though. That doesn't measure the actual harm. It doesn't measure harm at all. It's the culpability of the defendant. So they're, they're, there's two different dimensions that they're measuring. They're measuring two different things, essentially, and they have nothing to do with each other. It's, it's not two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, the Third Circuit came down in United States versus Banks and said, that in light of Kaiser, intended loss is no longer a valid measure of harm under the loss guidelines. And that's huge because very often the there may be a fraud that there was no loss or everybody got their money before the fraud was discovered. And it was just what, what the defendant intended or the defendant got caught in the process. And because it got caught in the process of the particular offense conduct, the, the loss, the actual loss was a greater. So then the then the government always argues for intended loss because that tends to be a lot greater and it's much easier to prove than actual loss. So now that the third now that there's a split among the circuits about whether intended loss should be is still valid. So what the commission decided to do is, well, this is an easy fix, they thought, and there's a logic to it. We will just take the definition of loss that's in the commentary. And we're just going to move it up into the guidelines proper. Okay. That's, that might solve the intended loss, actual loss dispute. But you know how many guidelines, how much commentary there is within the guidelines? Every a single lot. guideline has a ton of commentary. Yeah. Uh, you know, for just for example, there's there's a provision in 4B1.5 that talks about a pattern of activity in sex offenses. If you've engaged in a pattern of activity in sex offenses, uh, then you get a plus five. It adds five offense levels. Well, there's always been a debate about what pattern means. Mm -hmm. And pa generally to us, pattern a pattern is like many occurrences of something over and over and over again. That's a pattern. But the, the guidelines define pattern as at least two occurrences. And it doesn't have to be, you know, they don't even have to be related just two sex offenses, and that's a pattern, so you get a plus five. Well, that definition of pattern occurs in the commentary. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that's still the under Kaiser now, I would argue that pattern is not ambiguous. It's not genuinely ambiguous. Everybody knows what a pattern is, and it's certainly more than two occurrences, yeah. probably more than three, and they have to be closely related and blah, 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 blah. So at any rate, the, the point simply is this might solve a very specific issue with intended loss, but now it's going to open up a can of worms be, to the guidelines as a whole, because now everybody, and they should, should argue, well, the commission admits, implicitly admits, that Kaiser applies to the guidelines, and so therefore all guidelines should be read consistent with Kaiser, and that is, unless it's genuinely ambiguous, ignore the guidelines. And so it just depends on how you want to argue. Maybe maybe the commentary helps you. Then you want to argue that it's gen that the regu regulation or the guideline is genuinely ambiguous. And if it doesn't, then you want to argue uh, that it's not genuinely ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, so just before we leave this particular topic, all of this is going to get messed up even more because of Relentless versus Department of Commerce and Loper Bright versus Raimondo. These were two cases heard by the Supreme Court on July 17th of this year, the opinions should be coming down sometime soon, uh, most likely before June. And what both cases address is whether the Chevron doctrine should be eviscerated. And all the tea leaves are saying that that is what the Supreme Court is going to say, is that there is no Chevron doctrine. If there is no Chevron doctrine, then commentary, arguably, regardless of whether the guidelines are uh, ambiguous or not, all commentary is meaningless. Yeah. So, you know, the, the point the point simply is the commission may be, uh, the commission is only solving one little problem, but they, they have a much bigger problem if Relentless and Loper yeah. go the way the, the talking yeah. heads think they're going to go. Yeah. And probably should have so, waited, and just, is my point. And just to clarify why that would be meaningless is, make sure I got this analysis right. Yeah. So Chevron deference says, we have to defer to the commentary essentially Correct. because that's an administrative agency and they're the experts and they deserve deference. Yeah. But once you remove that deference, 
then whatever is not codified is subject to litigation. It would be open to challenge anything. Correct. Um, And so it doesn't matter what the commentary says. It's just litigate, litigate, litigate every little every little thing in those guidelines as to what they really mean and whether those yeah. things apply, which yeah. is probably okay. I think that I'm just trying to see was that a good thing for us or would that be a well? That's a, I, I think that's a good good thing for defendants. Um, yeah. It's a bad thing for the coherency of the guidelines because it's going to render the guidelines as currently written, yeah, inoperable. Because yeah. all of the commentary, all of the policy statements are going to be thrown yeah. out. And you know what one big policy statement is? 6A, uh, 6A 1.3, preponderance of the evidence. Uh-huh. So but now, guess what? They won't yeah, be yes. thrown out. They'll just, the commission will just move. They'll have a little move. They'll hire, uh, you know, the, the the five guys moving company. And they'll just shift everything from the policy statements into the text of the guideline and fix each one of those one by one by one by one, won't they? And so much for simplification of the guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, I mean they're, they're, they're you could argue they're that to it's... take with one hand and give with the other. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you just broader perspective on this, just so people know this isn't just in the weeds in criminal law. This yeah. is this is a seismic shift in administrative law. And I think that the, it there the are, BOP. Yeah. it's going to affect the BOP. It's going to affect the EPA, yeah. the FCC, the every administrative agency. And the, the really like rabid right wingers, I think, love this because what they're, you know, that whole like Steve Bannon deconstruct yeah. the administrative state because That's exactly it. Yeah. once we don't have to defer to these pencil pushing bureaucrats in the this agency or that agency, it opens the floodgates to special interests mounting massive litigation challenges to environmental protections, uh, you know, the F- whatever it is, but it's basically going to allow the special interest to come in and litigate the fuck out of these agencies into dust so they can have their way with whatever it is they're trying to accomplish in the world. I mean, that's that's my take on it. I think it's a lot of people's take on it. Yeah, no, that's that's exact. It's the it's the complete and utter vindication of Marbury versus Madison. Only federal judges, judges writ large, can say what the law is, not agencies. Okay, so we're getting off track here, but yeah. it really when you mentioned <laughs> no, but that's okay because when you mentioned Marbury v. Madison, my mind is going to the big issue, which isn't the subject of this podcast, maybe a subject of another, but it's presidential immunity. And in my, you know, when Trump's saying I'm I'm immune from fucking everything, if I was president, it's good. And isn't that akin to basically chopping the courts off at the legs to say the rule of law? You don't get to decide anymore, courts, whether this was legal or that was legal, because the executive branch has now usurped that degree yeah, of power right. to it, say. It, I don't have to defer to you, courts. I don't have to subject myself to you because I have total immunity. Ha, 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 ha. Which to me is one of the big reasons why the court's never going to grant in favor of Trump because they will be limiting their own power. Yeah. And there's nothing more than the court likes. Marbury Madison is the prime example of, yeah. of, of having the final fucking say in what is legal and what is not, what is constitutional and what is not. And immunity takes that right off, right off, right. you know, rug right. right, pulls the rug right underneath them. That's my two cents. And I know that's a, a diversion. So anyway, well, what what are the tea leaves? Do you think, Kai, do you think this, how do you think? Oh, yeah, this I think, well, like I said, I, th- I, I think they're going to get rid of, rid of Chevron. Get rid and, of Chevron. And then we, ha- and, and, and it's and open season on the guidelines. It's open season on the guidelines, okay. at, at least in the sense that, um, everybody's going to be able to litigate if they want, whether mm-hmm. particular guideline provisions like pattern are ambiguous or not. And, you know, the doubt, it, it, it well, actually, I think it's worse than that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Mm-hmm. All this am, ambiguity talk about in Kaiser is now itself meaningless. You just never defer to agency regulation. It doesn't matter if the or agency commentary, it doesn't matter if the regulation is ambiguous or not. Mm-hmm. There is no deference. 
only judges can say what the law is. Only judges can say what the guidelines say or mm -hmm. what the guidelines are, not the sentencing commission, mm -hmm. period. So all the policy statements, all the, the commentary, that is now rendered meaningless. And that's not just in particular guidelines. That's, you know, there are whole sex, whole guidelines that are labeled just commentary, such mm -hmm. as 6A1.3. And there's All a right. lot of that. And the so, takeaway is this, the intended loss issue is still fair game to litigate in, correct. in many jurisdictions. And, and by the way, we just won a pretty substantial ruling on that in the Eastern District of Wisconsin, I think it was, but the but the judge actually relied on, you know, all those arguments were made and Kaiser and deference and this and that. And it's not, it's in the commentary. But at the end of the day, the judge relied on something very powerful, very potent, and something we don't invoke all that often. And that is the rule of lenity. Yeah. And lawyers should remember that because I yeah. I've I know the rule of lenity, but so I forget. But we should have always have that little yeah. weapon in our arsenal because it basically says if there's a uh some sort of ambiguity there that you must resolve that in favor, in favor of the defendant. the defendant that's what the rule of lenity says it's tie goes to runner yes yeah. yeah yeah so always keep that in your, in your mind too yeah rule okay. of lenity all right rule of lenity. so speaking of that youthful offenders this is going to be quick yeah. so what the commission is proposing here and this is a good thing i i commend them for this is to get, uh, th this has been kind of consistent with the commission's recent focus on how uh, uh, criminal history operates under the guidelines or how it can be overly punitive. And so what the commission is, as we know, like the 4C 1.1, uh, the new zero point offender, you know, get rid of the, um, uh, uh, provide for a new downward uh, depart or downward adjustment for those with zero criminal history points. And, you know, in light of the fact that the, you know, recidivism is going to be low, lower for the, uh, for those with zero criminal history points. Now what the commission is doing, has done is youthful offenders. If you have any juvenile adjudications, those used to be, uh, uh, courts were to consider those and com uh, computing your criminal history. Now the commission is proposing to get away with those. And there's a couple of variations on them, but just, just generally speaking, uh, the commission is proposing to remove, to no longer count any youthful offenses that were committed as a juvenile towards calculating your criminal history. Good. You can still well, we'd consider like that. upward or downward departures and stuff, but that's good. So I would consider good. that a hit I could dance to. Yes. I like that. Yes. Okay. So good. now we have two, two, two more things. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll kind of go quick here. So acquitted conduct, you know, you and I have had a whole podcast on this. I think a couple. Even a couple. Doug Berman. Yes. Yeah. The ex so, ex uh, smackdown between you two. I'm going to put that in the show notes. That was a yes. lot. That yes. was a lot of yelling on that podcast. Yes, a lot I of liked yelling. it. Yes. A lot good. Of yelling. So once again, the commission is considering removing uh, acquitted conduct from consideration of the guidelines calculations. And there's a couple of variations there. They, oh, wait, wait, know, wait. Okay. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't heard all these podcasts, people need to understand how messed up this is. And it means you could be go to trial and have a jury find you not guilty Correct. on a charge. That's what an acquittal means, obviously. Yeah. But that later on at sentencing, either in the same case or even a different case, a judge could look at that thing that the jury said you are not guilty of and treat it as if you are guilty and use it to enhance your sentence. Right. How, how's exactly. that for fair? Yeah. Okay. And not this thing all. has been bounced. This is a ping pong match between the Supreme Court and the Sensing Commission because there are these cases yeah. pending before the court and the court won't hear them because they think the Sentencing Commission is going to do something. And the Sentencing Commission wasn't doing anything because they thought these courts were going to rule on them. Yes. And, but now the commission's got it again. Are they going to do anything? Although just, gonna... but, but just, yeah. just during, during last week's um, hearings, it came up. There was a question. I think one of the commissioners was asking, you know, maybe we should wait on the Supreme Court, you know, to to take a look at this. And it was like, oh God, no! <laughs> it's like the hot potato. Nobody wants to address it. You know, but it's and, like the it's like an unrequited love or something. It's like she's just not into you, dude. Like the yeah. court's not taking this. Yeah. Or maybe the court will, and maybe they'll change their mind. I don't know. Well, one one thing is Congress is taking a look at this. Congress has taken a look at it in the past. Did it go anywhere? Right now, there uh, there is legislation pending to get rid of uh, acquitted conduct out of uh, 3661 
which is this weird uh, statute, which I don't know how it's constitutional, but it's a statute that says judges can consider anything they want at sentencing. Mm -hmm. uh, but because it's a statute, I, you know, it's still subject to constitutional challenge. But at any rate, okay, uh, what Congress what Congress is considering doing with 3661 is amending it and stating that you can consider whatever you want unless it's acquitted conduct. And then they provide some definitions so everybody understands what they're talking about. Okay. Except for that Congress could fall into a bag of dicks and come out sucking their thumb like i don't have yeah, any it, it, yeah. i don't have any faith that they're going to do anything about i know anything, they, they didn't soon. do anything they didn't do anything before you know they might try to do you know do something uh, again ultimately though as even justice alito stated in one of his concurrences in a dissent from or one of his concurrences in a denial of cert on this issue last term only the Supreme Court can address the constitutional issue about whether acquitted conduct is unconstitutional or not. Yeah. Not the not Congress and not the commission. So uh, at any rate, th this is this is still an, a an active wow. issue. Yeah. It, whatever the commission does, it's not going to solve it. There's still going to be this problem out there. And courts could still consider acquitted conduct, even if the commission says don't consider it. Courts could still consider it, can consider it for purposes of a variance. And I, you better believe that the government's going to argue for considering acquitted conduct. Well, you know, I'm glad you raised that because when I was watching the hearings, I didn't see them all, but yeah. I was watching during that particular discussion. And again, it was like a punch in the gut because one of the commissioners said that very thing, like, does it really even matter if we do away with it? Because they mm -hmm. said basically doesn't 3553, right. you know, make this discussion point irrelevant because a right. judge can consider basically anything. Correct. And they were asking a defense lawyer who was testifying there and he kind of agreed with that. He kind of acquiesced to it. And I was very disappointed because mm. my answer would have been in an ideal world. The answer is no. Yeah. That if, you know, for a couple reasons, one is that little old something we like to, you know, think matters called the presumption of innocence. Mm -hmm. And so it's unconstitutional, it seems to me on its face, for a court to consider acquitted conduct for any reason under the guidelines or under 3553, because you're not guilty. You're not guilty. So why would mm -hmm. you be able to enhance something for something the Constitution says you're not guilty of? So mm -hmm. fundamentally, that pisses me off. And then the other thing is, if you look at Booker, and I know we're going to get in the weeds here, but it's mm -hmm. why I call this, you know, Studio 3553. I'm always saying that, but that's what I, that's literally what I call my office, because that is the cornerstone of our sentencing advocacy practice, because the guidelines suck so bad yeah. that we were liberated on when Booker happened, because when the guidelines became discretionary, then it opened up a world of possibility for us under 3553, which requires a judge to look at the client, the history, mm. the character, the nature and circumstances, all this stuff that we is deeply relevant to the human side of this, that the guidelines never take into account. But here's the bigger problem for me. Booker, what was the biggest problem that resulted in the challenge with Booker. It was a burden of proof. It was a constitutional issue. What's the we, difference between a sentencing factor and an element of the offense? Yes. That was the and big problem. The guidelines have all these sentencing factors that can increase, mm. increase, increase, increase. And mm. the judges could willy-nilly find, yeah, that's that applies, that applies, that applies yeah. by a preponderance of the evidence standard. Without the rules of evidence applying. Without the rules of evidence applying with that, and without mm -hmm. a right to confront, um, yep. confrontation and all this stuff. So it's fundamentally flies in the face of, of due process. Right. And the court knew that to be true. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't know what to do with that because they couldn't rule the whole guidelines were unconstitutional and just no more guidelines. They weren't ready to do that. Well, no, so they were five. Oh, wait, time out. No, yeah. five of them were. Five of them were did throw the baby out with the bathwater. Unfortunately, it was Ginsburg who screwed it all up because she was the she was the tie vote uh, or she was the fifth vote in both majorities. People don't realize this about Booker how unique it is. It's the only Supreme Court opinion in history that has two majority opinions. How can you get two majority opinions out of nine people? 
if one agrees with both sides, one uh -huh. says black, the other says white, and the other says black, white. And that was, uh, that was, or Ginsburg. is that gray? Would that be gray? No, because she agreed. She, no, because she agreed with both sides. It would, oh, it's not even God. gray. It would have been weird if she. It would have been maybe if she concurred in both. Okay, but no, she was part of the majority in both. Well, here's what we would have liked to see happen. I think what I would have liked to see happen, yeah. and I think what we were arguing for, which is, um, which was what happened under Blakely, which was an anal analogous state challenge to the state mm -hmm. sentencing statutes, which is okay yeah. if you want to impose these enhancements you need to do it with proof beyond a reasonable doubt yeah. right or even maybe in front of a right. jury with a right. jury like any other sentencing enhancement and they weren't about to to do that so instead the conclude i guess the consensus is well we'll just make these guidelines discretionary now so the judge has to look at them but the judge never has to follow them Right. And instead, they have to follow the 3553 factors. So circling back to why this analysis of acquitted conduct under 3553, it's like, okay, does that mean, doesn't that fly in the face of the whole point of the argument that there should be a higher standard of proof and the guidelines should have less mm -hmm. weight? Isn't it like a screw job to just basically say, well, now you don't have really any standard of proof you just say 3553 and I'm and I you know I know about all this acquitted conduct and mm -hmm. under nature under history and character of the accused I think you're you have a shitty history and you're a shitty person and I don't like your character and I'm going to hammer you. Yeah. I mean isn't it doesn't it make it easier for the judges not to follow the prescriptions yeah. of the guidelines? There's not even yeah. a preponderance of the evidence standard no. at that point. No. So the answer should be no in an ideal world she judge you can't and shouldn't consider acquitted conduct under 3553 because it flies in the face of the presumption of innocence and it flies in the face of Booker and the whole intent and point behind Booker. But, well, the, the way the, here's the only way to do it. And this this is another podcast. But the, the commission made a fundamental mistake at its very inception that screwed all this up and led to today and that it had a choice between real offense sentencing and charge offense sentencing. And it went for real offense sentencing. What is real? Who knows? Yeah. But it doesn't, it does not comport with yeah. due process. Right. Real offense sentencing and relevant conduct and all this other bullshit terminology mm -hmm. out there that gets around due process yeah. is not constitutional. It's but it's just not fundamentally fair. Right. Charge offense sentencing. We don't have real offense convictions. Right. <laughs> you know, well, right. you know. Yeah, we're going to charge you with a speeding ticket, but we're going to sentence you for murder because you really did murder somebody. You just can't prove it. I and mean, we don't do that. Right. Um, you know, Scalia actually gave an example like that, a case called California versus Monge back in the 90s. But at any rate, um, uh, charge offense sentencing is really the only way that uh, a guideline system can be constitutional. And that's what the commission has to go back to and start mm -hmm. all over again. But mm -hmm. that's, another, that's another thing. So I have one more. Just yeah. one more um, uh, issue here, to and this is this is the commission, uh, Riley, Wiley, sarcastically, cynically, maybe maybe cynically is the best word, cynically describes this this change that they're proposing as a technical amendment, and this is also an issue that you and I have. Um, oh yeah, this discussed. is our this is our zero point offender this criterion is the Zippo. ten. This yes. is Zippo Criterion 10. We've done Criterion a 10. couple few podcasts on that. So I gotta yes. put I gotta put those in the show notes too. But this yes. Criterion yes. 10, this Criterion 10 is killing us. It basically yeah. says if you got this leader organizer enhancement at sentencing, you are um precluded from receiving the two level zero point offender reduction. And right. um and so the language is super so you know, it's convoluted. This this is what the commission is proposing to change down here, 10 and 11. Right now, yeah. 10 and 11 are one and the same. And as we just, they, they're combined on the same line where it says the defendant mm -hmm. did not receive an adjustment under 3B1.1 and was not engaged in a continuing criminal enterprise. As we've noted, that whole phraseology, everybody's gotten stuck on and, whether and means and 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 means or, and I think that's, mm -hmm. and I've even written about it and I was initially stuck on it. It's irrelevant. It's where did that entire phrase come from? It came from the safety valve. Ding, ding. And that, that provision 
was put in there according to the legislative history that even the commission has cited. It was put in there to preclude management level drug traffickers who were engaged in a continuing criminal enterprise from receiving the safety belt. Mules or those who weren't management level in a continuing criminal enterprise could still get the safety belt. But this all had to do with drug offenses. And that mm -hmm. makes sense because if you are engaged in a continuing criminal enterprise, so then by definition, you're recidivating. Right. So, the, and the whole point of 4C 1.1 is to make sure that you're not, is to right. reward you for having no prior criminal history or at least no scorable right. criminal mm -hmm. history. Well, so if, it, if only the sentencing commission felt the same way. Because it seems to me they're still trying their damnedest to preclude leader organizer from getting the Zippo. Right. But this is what I would encourage people to argue out there is that even if this does go through and the commission now makes it really clear, just because you got a 3B1.1 adjustment, you're not eligible for the um, uh, for the Zippo. Council should still make the following argument. If that to read for C1, for the commission to do this is to contradict its own empirical findings. Back yeah. in 2018, the commission did a, a, a study on recidivism and found something very interesting that's actually surprised me. Those individuals that have received a management level adjustment, a 3P, 3B 1.1 adjustment, actually have lower recidivism rates than those that received no adjustment. In fact, if you got a, a management level, supervisor, manager, or leadership enhancement, you actually have a lower rate of recidivism than those who receive a mitigating role adjustment. This is according to the commission's own empirical findings. So the point simply is this, why is the commission excluding the least likely to recidivate of all of all those with criminal with zero criminal history yeah. doesn't make any sense in other yeah. words so if you have a 3b 1.1 adjustment and zero criminal history points you are the least likely to recidivate out of all defendants according to the commission's own empirical studies hmm. so to makes no sense to exclude them so therefore your honor you should depart or you should vary excuse me since we're not going to use departures anymore thank you you should vary down by the equivalent of at least two offense levels you know even though this might not technically apply it's yeah. silly to not apply it to just somebody who's involved in a fraud who got a supervised super, uh, supervisor role adjustment because they're at least they're more like less likely to recidivate recidivate than somebody who received no adjustment hmm and there's that data driven data guideline driven. thing. Yes, They're supposed exactly. to be da driven by the data, and that does yeah. not, that nope. doesn't comport. Um, right. Can you think of a rhyme, a word that rhymes with recidivism? Orange. Orange. <laughs> it's a given that the guidelines are data driven, but I don't know how to rhyme anything with recidivism. That almost well, works. Given Almost. ism, ism, given. Yes, but the, the problem is it's factually incorrect. The guidelines are not data driven. They well, were not they're supposed to be. Yeah, well. Is oh that well. their goal? I mean, that's what we Without call a... the blue material in the ABT. That's the heaven. That's the ideal world. That's our somewhere over the rainbow where troubles melt like lemon drops. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to sing that now, don't you? Somewhere yeah. over the... Anyway, are we done with guidelines? I think... I think we're done. Oh boy. Well, this was still, you know, this was interesting. So um what do you know what the timeline is for them to like uh yeah. put these out here and make a decision? In about two in about two weeks, they're going to um uh, publish their final proposed yeah. amendments. All right. Yeah. And for and by by the way, just you know, I'm being silly, but for this 4C 1.1, lawyers, clients. I don't care if you got the leader organizer, make, make yeah. the motion, make the yeah. motion, make yep. your compassionate release motions, bring it up. This is still an unsettled for now. And yeah. we have very tenable arguments that, that we should win under this. So, yeah.
Um, and, and, and you know, this doesn't if this if this does end up being one of their final amendments, that's not going to take effect until next November. So until then, make the argument that, you know, Criterion 10, just because you next got, November or this November? Well, this coming November. Okay. Yeah. November 1, 2024. OK. Yeah. 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 So you got till then, at least. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's a tough sell just because the language appears sort of uh, clear on its face, but it's not. It's not. It's not. And uh, if lawyers are nothing else, they're very, very good at making the clear unclear. Mm -hmm. So anyway, mm -hmm. I don't know. But anyway, I'll thank you, Mark Allen Buff, for coming back to set for sentencing and enlightening us and illuminating these issues and I guess stay tuned and we'll see what happens. I would say everybody right. should reach out and and but the the time for public comment is, is expired yes. on this. Yeah. So I think we just now have to sit on our hands and wait and see how all this shakes out and yep. see how Chevron deference shakes out in the whole bit. So yep. could be interesting. Stay yep. tuned. Very good. I'll be looking forward to that record. Anyway, see you man. That's it for today, but before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign up a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.